I think one of the unintended consequences of tyranny is that it strengthens people. Everyone knows that the fire from a little spark will increase and blaze ever higher as long as it finds wood to burn. Yet, without being quenched by water, but merely by finding no more fuel to feed on, it consumes itself, dies down, and is no longer a flame. Similarly, the more tyrants pillage, the more they crave, the more they ruin and destroy, the more one yields to them and obeys them. By that much do they become mightier and more formidable, the readier to annihilate and destroy. But if not one thing is yielded to them, if, without any violence, they are simply not obeyed, they become naked and undone, and as nothing, just as, when the root receives no nourishment, the branch withers and dies. That was a passage from a, a book called The Politics of Obedience, The Discourse of Voluntary Servitude by Etienne de la Botti. And this book was written in the 1570s, so it's quite old, but forms the basis of a lot of thinking in libertarian circles and has influenced a great number of individuals going into the 19th and 20th centuries. It's, it's achieved a kind of recognition for its power, its truths. And it's not a very long book at all. It's only about 40 pages. So today we'll be discussing the politics of, of obedience and what it is that tyrants seem to have over individuals. And not just individuals, but great masses of people. What is the psychological hold that a political leader, a king, or an emperor in ages past had over the multitudes of people who felt compelled to relinquish their freedoms, to allow themselves to live in lives of servitude and slavery, and subjected to the whims and oppressions of leaders who were tyrannical? It's an interesting question because as we look at certain movements, uh, political movements, as we look at leaders who are in positions of power in the world today, we have to ask ourselves sometimes, how is it that with so many millions of individuals who do see the tyrannical policies that are in effect and who are able to grasp the uh, ineffectual uh, leadership, uh, and that's a kind way of putting it, but the, uh, the oppressiveness that leaders quite often uh, implement over their people. How is it that, that so many have become used to their servitude, have, have been unwilling to find it in themselves to, to fight in some way and to regain their independence, their sovereignty? And what does it mean to fight? What does it mean to regain one's sovereignty as an individual? These are among many questions that uh, we look at today. And, but first we have to begin with the questions and we have to decide for ourselves, what are the right questions? What, what is it that exists in the system that makes people subject to the rules of tyrants? What do you guys think? Well, Etienne de la Boetie has his own ideas. Um, Murray Rothbard in his introduction calls this like the, the first libertarian piece of philosophical writing. And it was written, what, in like the early 1500s, I believe, um, something around there. That's, yeah, written in fi mid-1500s, 1552 to 1553, probably, around that time. And de la Boetie was... Uh, young guy studying, I believe, like law, 
and uh, in France at the time. And so he wrote this little this little treatise that was never published during his lifetime, but which was um, rallied around in various times afterwards. And like you said, it it it, it influenced. It eventually ended up influencing. Um, people like Tolstoy and via Tolstoy Gandhi because the main point of the main point in addition to his analysis of why people obey tyrants specifically and he had a specific uh, you know notion of what tyranny was what a tyrant was why in addition to that the main radical point of this book is advocating for uh, mass civil disobedience so he was probably the first you know, political philosopher to advocate something of this sort. You know, not a violent revolution or anything like that, but just simply saying no to whatever the, the tyrant wants of you, whether, to, whether it's taxation or going to war or um, anything of that sort. Just say, no, I'm not going to do it. And if everyone does that, he argues, then there's nothing that can be done. I think he's a bit, um, like Rothbard points out too, he, it, it, he he was an idealist, obviously at this time a, a young idealist, and it comes through in his writing that I, th I think some of the some of his arguments and some of his ideas are kind of um, youthfully naive. Mm -hmm. um, but on top of that, there he does have some some really some really great insights. Um, I'd say probably four four valid reasons for why why this happens you know why tyrants specifically are able to seemingly control millions of people and like rothbard said taken to its logical logical conclusion um or implication then it actually do doesn't just apply to tyrants it applies to government as a whole why do people listen to their governments when usually on the street you can find people complaining all the time about their governments well why do they why do they put up with it? <coughs> so, um, Labueti gives some reasons for that and, uh, and his solution of mass civil disobedience, literally disobedience, not being obedient to the dictates of a tyrant. <coughs> but along the way, um, well, I'll get uh, back to his idealism. Um, given that the time this was written, you know, 500 years ago, almost, and the the style in which it's written, it really is kind of a, an impassioned rhetorical plea. It's not so much a a fully reasoned analysis. And so there's a, there are several rhetorical flourishes, right? Where he'll make one point to he'll make one point, and then ten fifteen pages make another point that kind of contradicts the other one. But they they both still kind of gel together in the overall um, flavor of the of this kind of youthful radical libertarianism and so there's this contrast between the, that i see in this between these ideals that he has the the execution of his arguments for them um which aren't always totally successful but which i think have a kind of a, a root or a, a basis in certain principles that um that are the foundation of let's say a, a fully libertarian philosophy like um, like Rothbard um, argues for, and then there's kind of the the hard practical realities that are dealt with, you know, to some degree by Labueti, but which I think add another add some more layers that might kind of temper the temper his youthful fervor. And in his own life, you could see this play out. The way Rothbard describes it is that in his youth, he was a you know, an idealistic libertarian, and then in his adulthood, he was, uh, a, well, no, he, uh, he puts it something like he was a libertarian in the abstract, mm -hmm. that is in his logical reasonings, and a conservative in the concrete, because he was basically like a, you know, some type of court functionary in his, in his later, later years, basically working for the system that as a youth, you know, he railed against. Though, even then, he's careful in this early treatise to to totally absolve yeah. the the french monarchy right he's like oh well I'm, don't, <laughs> they're wonderful <laughs> don't 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 take this as me saying anything bad about the french monarchs we have the greatest monarchs they've never done anything wrong yeah. and uh 
and oh oh me oh my and so if i were to say anything bad about the monarchs then what would our poets have to write about and we would be robbed of our great tradition of of poetry of of, of our legends and of these great french monarchs um some have taken that to be some some have interpreted that interpreted that literally and said oh well he did uh, you know he he did have a, a strong reverence for the the french monarchy and rothbard just says no he was being satirical you know he wasn't being serious um that's Rothbard's interpretation, and that's pretty common when when you're writing in a in a certain political system, you can often get away with with saying bad things about that political system by pretending you're not saying it about that political system with over the top praise for the people you're actually criticizing. Mm -hmm. So you can go back and forth on that, but it's an important point that he was a libertarian in the abstract and a conservative in the in the concrete. And I think that there's a lesson to be drawn from that, too, that, um, well, we'll get into that maybe a bit later. I'll, I'll return to that. But first, we should talk a bit more about what he actually writes. And so in that opening quote that you read, that was pretty much the a summary of of his main radical point, right, that you can pretty much starve the tree of tyranny or put out the fire of tyranny just by not fueling it. And to get there, he he starts by asking at the beginning of the treatise, um, again with these rhetorical flourishes, why is it that that people obey a tyrant? And he kind of goes through the arguments. Well, is it because they have armies? Well, no, because why do the armies obey the tyrant? Like, what is the what is it that everyone gets out of this? Really, it's a tyrant is just one man. He can't do very much to you unless you actually let him do it to you. And that's his main, that's his, the main point that he gets to in the first part of the essay is that everything that a tyrant does is actually something that you let yourself, um, let be done to yourself. And there, so, so we start, well, he starts out that way and you might, well, for me, I'm, I, I was, I was thinking of all the possible reasons why that's wrong and he goes through some of them but then but then kind of ignores others or doesn't touch on them and then actually gets to some of them later on so he kind of he does make a pretty good point but that is his essential point is that the only power that um a, a man a, a powerful leader has over you is your own consent to to be under his thumb essentially and so he doesn't go so far as to call it cowardice, but at times he, he says there are examples of cowardice, but there's something else going on. It's not just cowardice because, um, well, for various reasons. So the, the question is why? And as he develops that first, well, he, an, an essential part of his argument is this idea of natural rights and, and liberty that, and he uses examples from the, the natural world. So he says, well, look at any animal um, there's no animal on the planet that that enjoys or wants slavery or um, servitude, and you see that in the natural world where you try to catch an animal and you and you and you put it in a cage, you enclose it, you you take away its liberty, it will fight against that naturally. And so he says that that's that he makes you know by analogy the same is true of humans. Which human, if you if you ask them, would you rather be free or enslaved? Which one would choose slavery just given that option. Not very many, if anyone. And so from that basis, there is, uh, that's why it's a, it's a natural philosophy of, of liberty and, and of natural rights is that there's something in the nature of things that is against um, servitude. Well, he, he speaks of people being denatured mm -hmm. of, of their will to live freely, which is a good observation. And the way he says this comes about is a few different ways. One, people are just utterly propagandized mm -hmm. and uh, socially engineered, which is, I think, one of the reasons why this book is still being read and referred to by many people. Because, yes, back in the 1550s, uh, there was propaganda. There was vast manipulation uh, being... Um, imposed upon individuals who didn't have any idea of how they were being coerced or manipulated or uh, otherwise tricked into 
believing that their leader was doing the best for them mm -hmm. in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. So that that's pretty insightful and something that we read about quite often in contemporary articles as well. So one solution to that is, is having a kind of education that people are, are missing an education as to, or into the very dynamics and manipulations that are occurring and how they occur and how it is that we have or fall into thinking errors and into uh, a, a kind of uh, pact, an unwitting pact with the leadership that is, in fact, oppressing us. So he gets into that. He also mentions the idea that individuals are quite often born into a certain culture or society or servitude where they don't know any different. And so they understand slavery in only a particular context or in a narrow view of things and don't realize how in fact they are enslaved in some degree or another mm -hmm. in, in that particular uh, time and place. So education is a, is a very big issue uh, that he brings up in this uh, reading. And, um, and also power structures. He mentions how, yes, you know, he begins by discussing how the, the tyrant is this only one man, but then he gets a little more nuanced and realistic about the whole thing and explains that really there's a whole structure of power that's underneath the tyrant, where there are six chieftains, perhaps, who benefit directly um, by what they're given by the tyrant, and under them there might be 60 or 600 sub-chieftains or, or vassals who serve them and, and get their cut of the pie, and, and then perhaps there are a million people under them who, who feed, who are these tributaries uh, into the power structure. Uh, who may not even realize it. And then when they get a tax return or a free meal or uh, some kind of gift from the government, they hail the tyrant uh, as being this wonderful leader when in fact it's all of their hard work uh, that, is, that is what has made the tyrant and his vassals uh, rich and empowered. And so... They're content with the scraps. They're, they're happy to have a bone thrown to them. And, you know, it's, <laughs> you look at uh, tax returns. I was thinking about <laughs> tax returns where you, you get this little piece back and you're so happy uh, when really you've been working your butt off for a whole year. It was your money to begin with. It, it's your money to begin with. And, and so it's, you know, and when you stop and think about how much of your money gets uh, extracted and how much of it is laid, laid waste, by the government or unaccounted for or uh you know we we've read stories this year about trillions upon trillions of dollars being lost in accounting by the pentagon for instance i mean this is this is mind-boggling what what trillions of dollars might do to uplift an entire nation not to mention an entire world uh just for one example so um yeah, he raises some good questions there and how we've been kind of tricked into our servitude and, uh, and made to appreciate the, the scraps and, and bones that are thrown to us um, because we don't know any better and mm -hmm. because we are isolated from one another, uh, basically, and programmed and propagandized into not communicating uh, this to one another. So a lot of good points there. Well, I'll read a funny bit. This one can apply to many modern-day politicians. I won't name any names, but uh, Labuetti writes, But, oh, good Lord, what strange phenomenon is this? What name shall we give it? What is the nature of this misfortune? What vice is it, or rather, what degradation? To see an endless multitude of people not merely obeying, but driven to servility, not ruled, but tyrannized over. These wretches have no wealth, no kin, nor wife, nor children, not even life itself that they can call their own. They suffer plundering, wantonness, cruelty, not from an army, 
not from a barbarian horde, on account of whom they must shed their blood and sacrifice their lives, but from a single man, not from a Hercules, nor from a Samson, but from a single little man. Too frequently this same little man is the most cowardly and effeminate in the nation, a stranger to the powder, the powder of battle, and hesitant on the sands of the tournament, not only without energy to direct men by force, but with hardly enough virility to bed with a common woman. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah, he had the, the chicken hawks nailed um, right from the beginning, 500 years ago. But again, so you get a, a flavor for the, the heightened heightened rhetoric of Le Boetti as, as he's presenting these points. And there's a ton of great little gems like that in this, uh, in this short book. And, but maybe, maybe one more, one more point before I want to talk about some of the things you mentioned, Dylan. Um, right, for, right at the very beginning, he brings up this idea of the kind of insanity of giving, of giving, uh, of freely giving over like supreme power to, to one person. And he points out that, uh, like years before, was it Lord Acton, you know, in his famous quote, that, pe that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, Labuetti wrote that, for the sake of logic, he should have maintained that the rule of several... Okay, he's talking about um, the words Homer put in the mouth of Ulysses. I see no good in having several lords. Let one alone be master. Let one alone be king. And so then Labuetti writes, For sake of logic, he should have maintained that the rule of several could not be good, since the power of one man alone, as soon as he acquires the title of master, becomes abusive and unreasonable. And goes on to say that you may, like, you may admire a person, you may have good relations with a person and, and have someone that, uh, that you think would be a good leader, but yet in the light of reason, it is a great misfortune to be at the beck and call of one master, for it is impossible to be sure that he is going to be kind, since it is always in his power to be cruel whenever he pleases. And then he makes, uh, he expands on this point a bit later, um, when he says, I fear that such a procedure is not prudent, that is, giving this uh, tyrant um, all of these things, inasmuch as they remove him from a position in which he was doing good and advance him to a dignity in which he may do evil. Certainly, while he continues to manifest goodwill, one need fear no harm from a man who seems to be generally well disposed. And then he goes on to the quote I read before about, um, about you know, what, what nonsense is this? And that, I think, is an essential point, and there's a nuance there. You know, Labuetti isn't always, isn't always that nuanced in this writing, but the, the idea of, because I was thinking about the, like, counterexamples, I always try to, you know, contradict what, what I'm reading to see if what the person I'm reading is saying makes any sense. And so one of the things that I thought about, well, if you look at the, at the, the natural state of, of humanity, even just in small groups, you naturally find that people will self-select in certain tasks or roles or social organizations to the point where there is a leader. You know, someone takes a leadership role and, and just gets something going with it, whether it's from the smallest project to like a, you know, a village or a tribe or whatever, to some, some person to, to um, kind of direct things, direct the way things are going. And that seems to work. It seems to be a natural part of the way that, um, you know, human behavior and, and our minds are structured. That just seems to be something that we fall naturally into. And you, you can often see in those small group dynamics what happens when there is no leader, when no one takes a leadership position. Often nothing will get done, or you'll have people at cross purposes. There does, it, it does seem to, there do seem to be positive aspects of someone taking the leadership role to, to get things going in the same direction and to, and to make sure they go, they go well. And ideally, that person will be qualified to be in that leader, leadership position. And people are generally pretty good at self-sorting in that way. Um, when, when left to their own devices and, you know, when there isn't al already kind of a, a structural um, culture in place that might, that might um, reward bad leaders kind of usurping positions of power. But when just left, you have a small group of people, if a, if a person who screws up royally, you know, gets elevated into a leadership position, well, they'll just be like, okay, you can't do it anymore. Um, we'll just have to get someone else to, to a certain degree. 
So there is this idea of a natural leadership position. So it's it seems natural that this would scale upwards and that you would get leaders at various levels of social um, organization. But the point that Lapoiti is making is that there is an inherent danger in in this process because at the level that he's talking about on the level of a state then what you are doing is you are you let you take what he's essentially saying is that you have that leadership structure where you have people doing the work people supervising and people leading and then you say oh well this is all very good you're such a great person well here let's give you um way more power than you actually have um, I would trust you with my life, but not only now am I just going to trust you with my life, I'm going to give you the power to kill me or let me live and get away with it mm-hmm. just because I trust you so much. And what he's saying is that in in that situation, because that's the way that governments are and have been structured, is that the, you know, the executive basically has that power, um, whether it's acknowledged or not and whether there are laws in place against it or not. I mean, that's the way things tend to work. Um, or at least have for the vast majority, the vast majority of human history. So he's saying, well, that there's an inherent danger in that, and that when you actually elevate a person to that position, what then is to to stop them from using that power, the you know the power of life and death, which the Roman emperor surely had, you know, and rulers all over the planet still have. Um, you know, at a word, you can be just wiped off the face of the planet for what might be no reason at all. And so he's, so what he's saying is that that is insanity. You, you shouldn't do that for the, even for the very, even for the reason that there's the possibility that things might go wrong, that even a good person put in that position may abuse their power. So he's basically advocating, well, they shouldn't, there shouldn't be the possibility of that even taking place. It It doesn't need to be that way. And as he'll, as he'll argue later on, this is what you were one of the things you were alluding to earlier, Ilan, is that one of the reasons that it's such a, a pickle for us, for for everyone, is that that we have been essentially bred into servility, because he he brings his examples and his arguments basically from classicism, so from the from the classics, from Greek and Roman history. And so he, he gives all kinds of examples like that. And he might give like a, a general example, like, like he mentioned, like the barbarian hordes, like people are very willing to fight for, for their freedom and to fight against the enslavement of, let's say a foreign army and a foreign king or whatever. And you see that. And, and often it's the, the greatest, you know, war stories or, or legends like the, the you know, the, the battle of the the 300 Spartans, you know, defending the pass at Thermopylae against the the Persians. I mean, it it was made into a, a pretty well Frank Miller and and uh, and what's his name the movie, um, a, a, a not re- very realistic portrayal, but you get the idea. That so people will naturally want to pr- to defend themselves, and they will. He makes the argument that they will be uh, an equally balanced army against an invading force will fight with more heart than the invading force. And I think that's pretty, probably pretty true because the invading force um, doesn't have as much motivation than the, the people defending their very livelihoods and their way of life. So you see that initial resistance to tyranny before its institution. But then once it's there, the next generation that has been born into tyranny will be complacent. So he says that that's one of his his good points is that there there is this habituation to servility, and that that is one explanation for why people do don't don't do anything because we are so humans are so adaptive. When you're born in a certain situation, you kind of you pretty much accept that as the way things are. Um, to well, most people most people do to a large degree. We'll just accept that that's the way things are and won't try to do anything different. And that's the essence of conservatism. It's like things work. Let's keep it. Let's not like throw things up in the air, and let's just get on with it. So, that, so the just like there's an inherent danger in the possibility of um, even a good person turning bad when given ultimate power, there is the the kind of inherent um, inherent negativity or the uh, of 
this habituation process, which which has its purposes and serves its has a function of instantiating and perpetuating a system of of tyranny over generations, simply because people don't want to change. Um, in addition to the other things you mentioned, like bread and circuses, mm -hmm. essentially bribes and entertainment, and that that um, that network of support that the the, the ruling power has. <clears throat> so those are kind of the the main ingredients that go t that go towards the the maintenance of a tyranny is the 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 habituation uh, and custom. The, the network of power that's established of people jockeying for position in order to you know get get their place at the trough, and then the bread and circuses. I think those were the, all the oh, oh and the uh, propaganda you know the the ideology and that takes the takes a few forms. One of which he mentions all throughout history is the the, the mystery which surrounds leadership. Like he talks about the Egyptians and uh, and all, all these kind of. Um, kings who who dress up in these ridiculous outfits that he says anyone with half a bit of common sense would just laugh at um, But there's this mystery like by not showing themselves to the people There's an air of mystery and almost divinity um, that accrues around these personalities and so People are in awe of this leader who as he mentions is just a man like any other and uh, then there's the 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 willful projection of the leader as being wise, benevolent, and and um, like in his godly rights as king. So the propaganda that this is the way things should be, and there's a justification, and and he's really a good guy, and that that propaganda also filters down into the that every decision, every law, every judgment made by a, by a leader like this is always given the the stamp of being for the public good. And the public welfare, and and keep in mind this was written 500 years ago, and things are exactly the same today. Mm -hmm. Every decision you know that any politician will make or any government is always presented, of, of course, as being for the people, whether it is or it isn't. And things, some things have um, toned down a bit. Like you, we no longer have, with minor exceptions, the the over the top, you know, outrageousness of like the the garb of the of the leader like most of our most of our leaders wear a suit and tie or or just the 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 culturally appropriate version depending on what what country they're from but you don't see these outrageous displays of like you know walking around with a platform on your head with flames coming out of it or like a, as one of the examples you gave so those are basically the elements that go go towards this tyranny that Labuetti is describing and well, well, yeah, go on. So one of the things you mentioned, Harrison, was uh, the, the bread and circuses that serves as such a, a good distraction. And on this subject, uh, he has a wonderful passage, which I'll read. It says, this method tyrants use of stultifying their subjects cannot be more clearly observed than in what Cyrus did with the Lydians after he was taken to Sardis, their chief city, and had at his mercy the captured Croesus, their fabulously rich king. When news was brought to him that the people of Sardis had rebelled, it would have been easy for him to reduce them by force. But being unwilling either to sack such a fine city or to maintain an army there to police it, he thought of an unusual expedient for reducing it. He established in it brothels, taverns, and public games, and issued the proclamation that the inhabitants were to enjoy them. He found this type of garrison so effective that he never again had to draw the sword against the Lydians. These wretched people enjoyed themselves inventing all kinds of games, so that the Latins have derived the word from them, and what we call pastimes they call ludi, as if they meant to say lydi. Not all tyrants have manifested so clearly their intention to effeminize their victims. But in fact, what the aforementioned despot publicly proclaimed and put into effect, most of the others have pursued secretly as an end. And I can't think of a better uh, time and place where this type of uh, subjugation is in effect than in Western society and culture 
where the te technocracy has made us so addicted to fun pastimes and games and entertainment. And I'm not saying that I, I don't enjoy some of it. I do. At the same time, it's a kind of a soft power. It's a kind of a, a coup over our uh, minds and our will. So that even as these profound world-changing events are happening underneath our feet, Western society is still, to such a great degree, completely obsessed with and uh, involved with bread and circuses, with a spectacle, with uh, fun pastimes. And there's a place for all of that, to be sure. Uh, you know, those things, you know, they have potential to be isolating, but they also have potential to create some social cohesion and, and bring people together. Leisure is important. We've done a show on leisure, so we're not discounting what place all of these things have. But at the expense of paying attention, of having a visceral uh, awareness of, of what's happening just behind the scenes, of what the trends are, of how things are being maneuvered to ultimately uh, disenfranchise us, so much so that one day we'll wake up and we, our currency will have changed. And all of the trillions of dollars in derivative debt that the investment banks and, and government institutions have been gambling their money and frittering away uh, will be forgiven by these, these, uh, by these new policies. And the world would have changed right under our feet. Uh, we have wars in the Middle East that, uh, that pretend even larger wars and destabilization globally. Uh, we have, you know, earth changes that we're told are one thing, but are quite often the result and, and you know, in effect, uh, yeah, the result of, of other processes that are in place. So there, there, are these, there are these big things that are happening right under our noses at this time, uh, which many people are in danger of being ignorant of and are ignorant of precisely because they've been, uh, they've been so distracted uh, and so, um, so used to the invisible uh, servitude, uh, the propaganda, the, the social engineering, and that's a, a big subject in and of itself, of course. But, um, but it's just very interesting how, you know, of course, you, you, didn't, have the, you didn't have the kind of high-tech um, entertainment access and ability to dissociate that you have today back then in the 1550s. Uh, but certainly uh, he could, he could see how this was used as a way to keep people asleep. I wonder what he would say today about the fact that it's not a tyrant doing it at all. It's, it's us. We are, we're the tyrants for one another. Like, you know, there's nobody, there's no tyrant forcing Justin Bieber to make songs or for, you know, for us to, to sit down and, you know, and, and watch 50 crazy YouTube videos by, you know, 50 crazy YouTube folk who just kind of did it themselves. Um, I think that, that that speaks to another, a deeper dimension to the, the problem of tyranny, mm -hmm. is that we are each other's tyrants and that it's, it's within our nature to to find um, ways that we benefit from tyranny and to turn a blind eye to the reality that it continues to you know fall on our head day after day as as things grow increasingly destabilized or corrupted um, because like you know in the past it was a little bit more simple, I suppose, in terms of like, if you have a tyrant, you see the tyrant and then you see his thugs or you see the, you can see, maybe you get to see what he's, what he's up to. If you're in the right place, you know, if you have the right kind of information, then maybe you can see like, um, like the author, I can't pronounce his name, but he, um, you know, he was in court and he was educated and he could see, you know, most, no, I don't think most people in the cities and villages maybe um, 
Go ahead. Well, I think that in the examples he's talking about, um, they would be pretty obvious. So, because he's basically talking about the a tyranny in the sense of you look at ancient life and examples such as the 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 king or his representatives will basically just show up at your farm and demand you know 30 percent or 50 or whatever they whatever they ask for of your crops or or whatever or you know the right of what was the right of whatever called where they could sleep with your sleep with any virgin in the in the town or the village or whatever like there's all these kind of like customs like that that i think in an ancient world would have would have been quite obvious and that that it's more so today that it that it's harder to see and that's why the the libertarian like philosophy is that that you know all government is essentially a form of tyranny um which is painting with a broad brush but but there is you know you can see why the argument is made and how it is made um but that's not to take away from your point because i think your point's still valid did you want to keep going with that yeah um yeah because it's i mean you can you can see it but uh your value system might not consider it as a grave and injustice as somebody who is a libertarian and only values yeah. and values freedom above all else um, as we've you know been discussing uh you know there are plenty of people uh the majority who don't uh, have values like that and that uh, freedom isn't the most important thing um comfort is more important uh safety um you know family just and the, most people the think the existence free. of you know the continued existence of the family and yeah. and so on and so forth uh you know there's there that in that hierarchy of values doesn't have you know freedom at, at its very top um and also uh that you know that that kind of leads to the different mm, ex levels of acceptance i suppose for uh for a, a tyranny that's as obvious as that and also you know in in like you know life is just horrible and there's there's monsters and there's thus little sheep <laughs> who you know try and hide from the, the wolves but i think that it's it's within that state of mind that his or or, or seeing that um seeing that reality as what it is and that there are you know people out there who would rather not have the king come and just take their daughter um, mm -hmm. but that they also want to keep their other two daughters and they want their son to you know survive and to you know and they want to continue mm -hmm. to live themselves um that his call for mass civil disobedience uh something that it's not um it doesn't require a a different socio-political structure you don't need to turn marxist you don't need to throw away your traditions or anything um, all you need to do is say no to this behavior mm -hmm. and to say it with enough force that others around you you know will can concur and can you can you know kind of unite in in purpose and to you know and to institute changes to, that will benefit you know to actually benefit your fellow man and to live in a more um orderly and organized and lawful i guess lawful with the laws based on on, on higher values and that um you know in in the the principle of you know if the uh, crimes must be punished uh, regardless of who commits them that it's not might makes right it's not just because you're born to some family that you get to do whatever you do that there is a, a higher foundation for law and that that law applies to each and every one of us um, regardless of how powerful or rich or whatever you are and that ultimately everyone pays when that law is not um enacted when yeah. i mean we all we all pay for that and i think that's what he's saying is like this is the proper way to bring justice to to individuals in high places who commit crimes against their nation against their ancestors against the you know just the entire society that you need that there needs to be something to be done to hold the to hold these people accountable because i mean obviously it's, uh, you can look throughout history when, when not there's uh, it tends to towards bloody mm -hmm. bloody insurrection civil war mass civil unrest all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff well and the the problem is that that's it's very 
hard to achieve in the concrete, right? And then mm-hmm. that's why I think I'll come back to this example of Labuetti himself, who was libertarian in the abstract and conservative in the in the concrete, because I think there's <clears throat> there's kind of a middle ground that people have to take in their idealism, because you can just be a, a hard nosed idealist with no regard to practical realities, and that doesn't achieve anything. Or you can be a full blown conservative with no ideals whatsoever and no awareness of the like the the injustice that can that can be mm-hmm. happening in the present, right? And the I think the the middle ground would be be to never lose a sense of idealism, a sense of some of right and wrong, but to temper that with realities. And you see that in in like the in the context of Labuetti and Rothbard, you see that in libertarians like like Ron Paul and Rand Paul, mm-hmm. who engage in a political system that they don't agree with because they want to try to inject the, a, a bit of their ideals into the existing system. So you see that kind of like working working against the system from within it, and that's one way of approaching that. But from a just a, a from a more practical perspective for for most people, I think it should just be to to never lose sight of what what seems to be the reality that there is tyranny in various forms and of all degrees going on and it should be it should be seen clearly for for what it is and wherever it is but at the same time to um well to well i haven't figured out how i was going to formulate that thought yet to 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 see it and but then to still be able to to act in the world and that's where a response to a response to tyranny c- comes in, like um, t- so. To use your example of the of the mass civil civil disobedience and the need for justice, well, you may not get justice, because the, you, you see that, and leaders in particular rarely get justice. And if they do, you, you have some examples of it of of leaders being thrown out and and revolutions being raised and, and assassinations of, and things of that sort. But to have it actually uh, occur in a in a lawful environment, you don't see that happen very often. There's all kinds of corruption and scheming and and just letting things slide that goes on. So, what should a, a person's reaction to that be? Well, I think it should be to to hold the ideal in mind that that really, yes, there there should be justice. There should be a, a system of accountability. Now, that may not actually happen. So, what do I do in that situation? Well, there are different kinds of freedom, right? There is the political freedom that I think should be should be uh, striven towards by by peoples everywhere, and that is just to, just a basic level of freedom, you know, not to be enslaved in various ways. And then there is the internal freedom, you know, that that can be achieved and experienced regardless of the state of of government one is living under. And you find that that freedom exemplified in philosophies like the Stoics, who you know, no matter no matter what condition you are living in, you can be free internally. You can have an inner degree of freedom that you are not. Um, buffeted and, and pushed around by the externals of the world, but that there is an inner solidity that can never be broken by the external world. And that's, I think, the, that's the, for me at least, that's the highest ideal of freedom and of liberty is an inner freedom and an inner liberty. But I still think that, that there is a, a correlation to the external world. Like there is, a, there is such a thing as freedom in the external world and kind of, and a political freedom at a very basic level. You know, people I think should, should be and and deserve to some degree freedom on a very basic level that most of us or a lot of us a lot of humanity doesn't have or didn't have um throughout our entire throughout our whole history that that ideal should be held in mind and i guess you know held in the heart at the same time of realizing the the practical realities that we face Mm -hmm. and that people have faced at all times and um that leads me to just one more one more criticism I had of. Well, or do you want to go? I, with yeah, that? I'd like to comment on yeah. some of those things because that seems to be a, a a kind of central issue of what we're discussing here. How how do we how does one look at all this and translate it into practical action or inaction or uh, you know the if your freedom is in your heart, um, but it also requires some some action in the world, some uh, agency that uh, allows you to exist with some amount of dignity and um, and sense of purpose and meaning 
uh, you know, the, you have all of these things that you're trying to reconcile, especially if, if the tyranny becomes more overt. Uh, so um, Della Boetti has this to say. I'm just going to get to the last sentence here because it leads into some, uh, some good ideas, I think. Uh, he says, from all these indignities, such as the very beasts of the field would not endure, you can deliver yourselves if you try, not by taking action, but merely by willing to be free. And by this, I don't think he means not, not acting purposefully in the world. I think he means, you know, not acting like a full-blown radical. And, and it's, it's from this first intention to be willing to be free, to live as freely as, as one possibly can, you know, finding the third way, mediating the, the intention of, of being free next to all of those external forces and even internal forces that would seek to keep us oppressed, that that would be uh, the way to go. And so how does, this, how does this present itself in practical living? What does this look like? So James Corbett, um, the, uh, the, the journalist, uh, online media personality, who's uh, pretty insightful and who's also a big fan of uh, Della Boetti, I didn't, I didn't listen to his video on the subject, um, but he did recently have an article on the Agora, which is the exchange, the meeting place that, that people uh, use and, and go to. And, and this ancient idea of the agora uh the market the 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 place where people can form social connection and perhaps exchange goods and services as well as information and knowledge uh through networks of people who who see its utility who see its value uh is i think an important avenue for uh taking action in, in the ways that one can, uh, and, and freeing oneself. So he starts his article about the Agora by saying, visited a friend in violation of a lockdown order, frequented a New York bar that didn't offer substantive food to go with your beer. Congratulations. You're a thought criminal. And here's the best part. There are more thought criminals being born every day. What am I talking about? The counter economy. That's what. And he gets into what the counter economy is. You know, it's the, it's the woman who owns a boutique who refuses to close down and continues to serve customers and make a living and then challenges it in court when the police come and raid it. And that's, that might be an, a, an extreme example. No one wants to spend a month in jail uh, having to prove their case. Uh, but the point is that when there is this will to be free, people will get together and they'll find like-minded other people and they'll find systems uh, of economy. They'll find systems of exchange. They'll find systems of, of reinforcing one another's, um, worldview which is which has the potential to be very constructive and and not following the tyrant or the tyrant's ideas or the infrastructure that uh that says that you must uh do this or that against your own personal values so we'll probably link to that article in the uh in the show notes of uh this week's show because it's quite useful in in how to practically address some of these issues i think that that article uh makes me think about uh one of the you know unintended consequences of of tyranny and that is to serve as a kind of a catalyst for the rebirth of values and ideals that um, people come together and they they talk and they discuss um, the problems and they start to reforge uh, normal social bonds that had been absent um, you know for sometimes for decades 
um, sometimes for years, but they start to reinforce just the very simple, normal, um, and healthy human bonds, and they try and work things out. And that that process um, helps to reinvigorate traditions that were lost or relegated to you know just some dumb history class. You know how I didn't. How I hate learning about this or this or that. Or I, you know. But then when all of a sudden you're faced with um, tyranny and life or death, all of a sudden you you start to discover the the values and the virtues of the the heroes that you that you had or that your nation has or that your religion has, and you start to look to them and you start to um, try and discover that those abilities within yourself to you know, your ability to discern, you know, good from bad in any given situation or your ability to discern who to trust and who not to trust, how to act, how to go about life, you know, in what um, continues to resemble more and more of a an abyss or a jungle. And you, you just have to dig deep. And I think that's, you know, that's a good, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And then when people are coming together and doing that together, that's like I said. I think one of the unintended consequences of tyranny is that it strengthens people. Yeah, and it strengthens people. And I think for people who already have a a sense of of thinking for themselves, of of wanting to get at something like the truth of things, getting to the bottom of things, getting to see where tyranny exists where maybe a lot of people don't see it or don't want to see it. It puts them in a very good or a much better place from which to respond to their environment and to those things that they see unfolding around them. So that's probably a good place for us to end today. We thank you for listening. We hope you have a good week and don't be subject to tyranny if you can help it. Thanks for listening, everybody.